Good evening, uh, good evening to all, buonasera a tutti e tutte. Uh, this evening is, uh, I'm very pleased to present you. Uh, Maddalena Borsato is a, a PhD candidate of our university, Dordia, with other class of uh, uh, other uh, people that spoke uh, in this conference as Maria Flora, Chiara Flora Bassignana, etc. And uh, it's very interesting, uh, uh, her experience, because it's also uh, was in the past an uh, assistant pastry chef. It's very lover of uh, this uh, interesting job. But it's very uh, abilities and competence within to uh, create a mixing between uh, a theoretical aspects of uh, gastronomic sciences and practical aspects as a pastry chef. Then I think that is a very interesting uh, conference. And then, uh, please, uh, Madalena, thank you very much for your disponibility for this conference. And then it's possible to begin uh, 30, 35 minutes and after the time for the questions of students. Thank you very much, please. Thank you. So. Let me, uh, this, uh, can you see my slides? Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, I hope uh, you can hear me because, uh, I don't know, I have some problem of connection. Never had it uh, and now I have it. So tell me please uh, if my voice uh, at cert a certain point disappears. <laughs> Um, so this is the the title of my of my little lecture of today. Um, Triumph of gluttony is the name of a very famous conventual uh, uh, cake that we are going to uh, see together. Uh, first of all, uh, um, a brief uh, uh, biographical note, very brief. Only for the people who doesn't know me, maybe no one here. <laughs> but I'm uh, Madonna Borsato. I'm one of the PhD students of Pollenzo, one of the seven in uh, eco-gastronomy, education, and society. Um, my background is mainly philosophical. Um, I have uh, a bachelor and a double degree in philosophy of religion, and as uh, Professor Carvo already said I worked as a pastry chef uh, also in Palermo and I want to mention it because it's part of the topic of today and uh, my field of research is uh, philosophy and gustatory aesthetics and in particular the case of sweetness but also the connection between food and religion and the bodies and obesity. Uh, so, uh, this uh, short lecture I want to give you today is based on a research that I'm uh, doing and that is still ongoing, um, having therefore uh, areas of, um, of uh, oh, sorry, uh, areas of light but also of shadow. And uh, if it may seem an historical research, I would say it is uh, not, or not uh, exactly, because uh, uh, the subject, uh, um, about this subject, there is uh, really a lot uh, already, and uh, it would have been uh, almost uh, inappropriate to, to add something from uh, an historical point of view that is not mine. But uh, it is a philosophical reading of an historical heritage. And uh, I decided to bring this uh, kind of a specific and particular theme to today's lecture because uh, uh, I think it could be interesting to deal with it. So to deal with this idea of enclosure and cloister in connection to pastry uh, at a time when uh, we all feel uh, a little bit uh, caged uh, and uh, eager to communicate uh, in other ways other than through the use of our bodies. And um, maybe um, through, these, uh, through the questions that uh, can raise up uh, this, uh, this uh, specific topic, uh, we can find also uh, new ways that go beyond the, the, our face into a screen that is always uh, 
present or our voice, uh, our voices into a phone. I don't know, maybe it could be interesting. Speech shapes our life continuously. And uh, I want to tell you a story and a narrative in, without a speech in a way that it's kind of contradictory, I know, but uh, uh, maybe it's also a new way of understanding things. And uh, so let's start with the story of today. These are the main ingredients, um, the main topics. Uh, yeah. I want to deal with uh, this uh, idea of uh, cloister rules uh, and, and the body. And uh, to do this uh, and to better comprehend the role uh, and the intertwining of this conventual com confectionery, my reference point uh, are taken from one of the most vivid and receptive the past tradition of Italian gastronomic culture that is the Sicilian conventual one. And uh, uh, I want to, I would like to touch some um, specific characteristics that are, have has to do with sweetness, eroticism, humor, the typical trait of the Baroque, but also this idea of the gift, because pastry were often made uh, as donation either to various important personalities at the time, as well as to grieving families or to the most uh, intimate confessors of these nuns. And uh, the attitude toward uh, the um, attitude of the church toward this uh, um, rich production has always been uh, ambivalent, and uh, it was also sometimes and uh, um, I mean, the nuns were obliged to stop producing sweets because uh, there, there was a, a, a too um, big uh, destruction uh, during uh, Holy Weeks or during festivities. There is a nice example from a synod in the south of Italy where the, the synod banned the commercialization of, uh, of cassatas, of cas that is a typical uh, Sicilian uh, cake for the period of Holy Week because uh, everyone was uh, was dealing only with cassatas and not with the functions of the religion. Um, but let's start from uh, the beginning, and uh, um, I want to read you uh, sometimes pieces of uh, memoir from different writer that uh, dealt with uh, with this team. And uh, Fulco di Verdura, who was uh, the cousin of jo Tomas di Lampedusa, wrote that both at Christmas and at Easter time, the nuns from all the different convents sent us extraordinary sweet meats, which they had made themselves. But the king of conventual pastry is the inexplicable, majestic, and also mythical triumph, so the triumph of gluttony which on some great occasion was commissioned from I no longer know what special convent it was. I do not attempt to describe it because the name alone speaks for itself, but it seems to me covered with every good of God. And uh, so um, conventual convection, confectionery and pastry represent a particular uh, tradition that uh, can be found in uh, uh, different parts of the Christian world. Uh, closely related to uh, the rise of uh, women monasteries all over the world, but which mainly involves uh, more strongly Catholic uh, areas, uh, such as the south Southern Europe and the respective colonies. The abilities of the nuns so were uh, known for this preparation of sweets, but also for ointments and spirits, so all these uh, um, things that can be preserved uh, for a longer time. And... Um, these um, these uh, gifts were um, part of their economic economic livelihood, but at the beginning they were actually sweets and donation to um, make a bond with the, with an outside that was as feared as desired. And uh, I put here some examples of this conventual pastry that comes not only from Sicily, like the, this photo of the Frutta di Martorana, that is a typical uh, conventual sweet from Sicily, but also from uh, Dossaria Conventual, that mm, it's the, is, the, is the pastry from, uh, from Portugal. It's a tradition very uh, widespread in the southern of Europe, but also in the south of America and uh, in Mexico, for example. Um, another example, examples that I want to bring you 
at the very beginning of this speech, is uh, one of uh, the few cloistered uh, convents that uh, is still open and active today. Uh, that is the Benedictine Monastery of Palma di Montechiaro in the south of uh, Italy, uh, of Sicily. That it, it, it's also mentioned in the famous novel, The Leopard. Um, it's interesting because uh, the monastery is uh, um, still today very famous for uh, its uh, production of uh, biscotti ricci, these almond crinkle cookies. And uh, I had an interview with uh, with, the with an architect, an architect uh, that is uh, responsible for the restoration of this monastery, and he told me that there are still three nuns inside that still prepare and leaves uh, from the preparation of these wheats. They prepare a lot of uh, different uh, between ten and twelve var var varieties of uh, sweets. But, uh, I mean, the most famous is these uh, um, almond crinkle cookies, uh, famous throughout uh, Sicily. And uh, the other interesting thing, uh, there is also a picture of the nuns. Uh, there are three now. Um, the other interesting thing that uh, brings us to the first, um, this idea of enclosure that I want to uh, speak about it uh, is this uh, wheel that they still use, uh, these nuns, to uh, sell uh, the sweets because they cannot have uh, contacts with the, with the outside. And the wheel, it's this gimmick uh, acting as the only physical junction between uh, inside the convent and the outside, the society. And the wheel uh, acquires, uh, for me, a strong significance uh, since uh, the, the practice of pastry donated or sold through it uh, can be seen as one of the few forms of physical contact uh, across the fence. And uh, let's try to deepen uh, a little bit uh, and very briefly this idea of enclosure and of closed rules uh, um, in order to shed also a light on uh, the connection between sweetness and communication. Um, although with uh, many historical variations, uh, monastic cloister is basically characterized by the prohibition of going outside the boundaries of the convent and the compliance of the three fundamental uh, uh, monastic vows, namely chastity, poverty and obedience, carried out through contemplation, prayer and above all obligation of silence. Throughout all the Middle Ages and part of the modernity, the only option covered by law for female destiny were marriage or enclosure. So uh, the first uh, ball was this one, the Periculoso, from Boniface VIII in the 13th century, who said that all and sundry nuns, present and future, to whatever order they belong and in whatever part of the world, shall henceforth remain perpetually enclosed within their monasteries. And uh, this was the, the, the birth of uh, enclosure for uh, women monasteries. Uh, but uh, before the Council Reformation, I put some, uh, some uh, time, uh, uh, some temporal uh, things here to better understand. Uh, uh, it was only with the Council of, Trin of Trent in the 16th century that there was a, a, a strict rule for the nuns obliged to uh, keep silence, to stay inside, and then uh, there was uh, a, an entrusting of these rules uh, some years later, and some other popes that makes uh, other rules, but uh, until the second half of the 18th century, cloistering remained on a legislative level the only form of female monastic life provided by the Catholic Church. And uh, mm, I think the most interesting uh, thing for me about it, uh, and also for the connection with the, this wheat production, is the design of time and space made uh, from these rules, uh, and also the architecture of this cloister. As uh, Evangelisti, who is an historian, well explains, uh, all windows, gates, grates, uh, and any other openings connecting the interior with the public highway had to be walled up including the doors that join the convent to the church. So besides exceptional reasons like wars, epidemics, uh, or very strong illnesses, no nun could leave uh, the monastery and no outsider could enter 
in it. Only the priest in charge of the sacraments uh, was allowed inside the cloister, but always for a short time and always accompanied by the four elderly nuns. And this multiplying of walls and grates around nuns, I think it becomes symbolic in making their spatial life a sort of jail from one side, but also a sort of secret garden. There is this idea of the ortus conclusus that is a symbolic, but also a physical space where all the virtues of women as well as of nature are preserved or renovated from the the, the external and chaotic and sinful world and where contaminated nature also of women can return to its original purity as the song of the songs from a biblical uh, reference uh, said you are a garden locked up my sister my bride you are a spring enclosed a sealed fountain so physical segregation was thus fundamental to respecting the vows Enclosure, enclosure was uh, experienced in different ways uh, by some nuns uh, as an obstacle and a forced separation from the real world and their families, which often were actually the perpetrators of this forced uh, separation and monasticism, but uh, um, also from others as a, a defensive and safe escape from the pressure of society, as in the case of the famous Teresa from Avila, uh, who liberated herself from the constraint of a society uh, corrupt for her and also from an unwanted marriage. The other interesting thing it's, it was that there was, was not only a spatial uh, seclusion, but also a time control uh, over all the actions of the nuns. The relations with the family were reduced to fleeting encounter uh, within the rigid separation of these grills. And uh, from one, uh, you can hear a, a feeble, the voice of the nun, but uh, you cannot see her figure. And this idea of the face, I think it's something interesting also today that uh, we see faces everywhere. Face uh, as uh, the inalienable way of uh, relating uh, to the other person was uh, some how excluded from this kind of life, of life. And in this case, I intend the face as part of uh, a rational understanding of the relationship that we can have, where uh, sight and hearing are the only possible communication vehicle. The, my idea is, my, I ask myself uh, at the same time that uh, her place in the world, uh, her present of the present of a nun in the world, can somehow be expressed otherwise, namely by her practice and by materialized acts. So true, a sweet production of meanings. This is the idea. And uh, um, let's make only another brief uh, I think about this uh, uh, connection between inside outside this uh, physical segregation through the words of Abelard. Um, Abelard, who wrote a treatise for Eloise, who uh, uh, they were famous for uh, this, uh, this, lover, this love. And Abelard wrote that solitude is indeed necessary for the nuns in order to defend their fragile nature from the temptations of flesh and senses. So this idea of cloistering, transform itself from protection of the woman from an outside to protection of the woman from herself and from her fragility. And uh, Habelard was really focused on the tongue as this uh, tiny part of our bodily, big bodily structure that is a junction between uh, the sensible taste and the verbal language and for him was the source of all evil, above all in women, whose bodies, he said, are softer and muscular, more flexible. And he uses the words of uh, Paulus that are very clear about it, uh, telling that uh, let a woman learn in silence with full submission. I permit no woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She is to keep silent. And so it's perfectly clear that for Abelard, and for pa Paulus, of course, the relationship between corporeality and the feminine is strong enough to prohibit any possible use of the, of the body. So Abelard 
advises Eloise and the nuns to use signs in place of spoken words. So this idea to this direction of using signs and gestures, it's significant of an understanding of the voice as a an expression of our intellect as a, a, an external externalization of our soul and uh, Abelard sees in the meaning of the voice the, the direct external manifestation of our own interiority and that's why the nuns have neither right nor ability for him to use it but there is one exception about the voice that I think it's interesting. It's the use of the voice to sing. The nun could sing. The nun could sing because there is a different level connected to the sense of hearing. See, singing, together with writing also, is a different expression modality. It's a way to use the voice, but not the rationality inherent in it. To sing does not break the rules, the dogma and does not produce uh, an articulated language uh, and in consequently does not produce uh, a male culture the nuns uh, are authori authorized to use their voice uh, as part of their body and as an enactment of a sound connected to a dogmatic rule but not their semantique so their voice uh, with the articulation of words uh, the outside expression of an internal thinking and uh, uh, this is kind of, I think, uh, of, interest, uh, of interesting about the use of the body that the nuns could make. And that's, that has a connection also to the uh, role of writing. And uh, I want to tell you only very briefly because it was not so touched, the role of writing, because uh, most of the nuns were an alphabet. But there is uh, some famous examples like uh, Juana Inés de la Cruz, uh, uh, that was a, a, a huge novelist and a huge dramaturg uh, from, uh, San, from the convent of San Jerónimo in Mexico City. Uh, for her, writing epitomizes a strategy to obtain recognition and to regain some of the suppressed rights. And producing written languages, she was a novelist, a poet, a dramaturg, uh, um, Producing written language, languages was for her, either religious or profane, a, a, a mean to be present, to exist and to be significant in the world. But there is a level of writing that for me is more interesting and that brings finally to our sweet uh, things. That is uh, the cookbooks that she wrote and that many nuns wrote. Uh, it's a level of writing that uh, um, works as a collective art in connection to baking and to cookery. The many written recipes uh, are witnesses of uh, an oral traditions of the nuns. And there are a few notebooks of recipes uh, that are chaotic and uh, un uncategorized piles of uh, sheets uh, uh, composed uh, probably from different hands all together in which there are instructions, ingredients, prayers, drawings, uh, suggestions all together mingled and this unsystematic way of writing is the transmission of uh, from one side a repetitive daily life but also of improvisation of a different kind of knowledge of knowledge that consolidated in gestures and in this case, writing does not, not stand for a, a transcription of our thoughts, but it's more a, a mixture and an amalgam of secrets that can only be shared by those who are able to decipher our science, so by our community, by the nuns, the nuns. And this, I think, it's very, very interesting also as a daily aesthetic engagement through baking and through cookery uh, of a community like the one of the nuns. Um, let's go now to finally to this idea of uh, conventual pastry and of communication through conventual pastry because this mention of writing and silence um, helps us to understand and that uh, can, there can be a dimension that conceives uh, communication not as a mere exchange of information, but uh, um, beyond the, 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 the P 
pietism uh, that uh, in which we can uh, understand the nuns uh, because they are uh, i mean they cannot they, they cannot speak uh, and they are a system uh, they are a victim victims of a system imposed on them but beyond this idea i think that the nuns still remain uh, producers of meanings which cross uh, the boundaries of uh, a simple devotion and uh, it can be seen more as a struggle toward empowerment and self-determination so what interested me here through this conventual conventual pastry is not uh, that giving the impression that making pastry is uh, a kind of language forced by circumstances or that only in the absence of the classical uh, verbal possibility of speaking and of uh, listening uh, they are obliged to rely on uh, on uh, on uh, these means rather i aim to show that another way of communicating is feasible and that communication is not limited to one way or nor to certain circumstances but has to do with the commonality and with the with the sharing and to do this uh, i uh, want to use some examples of uh, uh, the sicilian conventual pastry uh, why because uh, sicily was the first uh, european cane sugar producer and because uh, there was uh, an overlapping of different cultures and transformation of the island through uh, through different influences uh, to make some examples about pastry the Saracens, the saracens brought to the island exotic ingredients the normans the of the ovens the arabs the costumes of these meticulous and uh, um, decorations and the contrast of flavors the spaniards the idea of baroque in confession in confectionery the British, the use of from the colonies, the, the use of rum, of rum, and of chocolate, and finally the French, but later on, the use of uh, cream, uh, butter, and fat custards. Um, Sicily uh, is, uh, I mean, all these perspectives together, and there are also a lot of legendary tales, uh, made the Sicilian monastery production very rich and also the origins in a way the cradle of italian pastry and to some extent also the root of our modern european pastry um, through this idea of uh, conventual pastry uh, we can we can see these new forms of uh, communication and um, i mean the reasons are uh, are multiple for sure but uh, we can start uh, making the three consideration that sweetness is associated with festivities and therefore plays a role of ritual and symbolic messenger um, but i think there is something more i think that the nuns in their kitchens establish mutually beneficial dialogues that were verbally aphonic so without speech, but that they, 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 they can produce language and exchange and manage to uh, convey messages. So the nuns interact materially, establish, establishing relationship, accepting or questioning, and this is interesting, uh, contents and value through the names, the shapes and the flowers of the, of the sweets they produce, they were ab able not only to show the, a devotion, but also to to go against uh, something that there was imposed uh, on them. And uh, I think also the the concept uh, together of uh, this uh, teamwork, uh, this kitchen and laboratory activities uh, that belongs to the monastic community. Uh, it's nice to understand the work of uh, daily life. Uh, and also, I mean, ritual daily actions that uh, uh, we can see not only in the religious practice, but also in the artisanal production. So bakery and cookery are uh, experienced as a space through which community and the nuns, um, they produce a new kind of communication. The, the question is always the same. Are words really necessary? 
to bring light to a practice, to make it universal, to communicate it. I have the feeling that the nuns through baking uh, under, um, experience a complete body, uh, bodily attention, what uh, some scholars named disembodied knowledge, and uh, the gestures uh, of the nuns that are not certainly without uh, thinking are, in, are uh, the interaction, are made from the interaction of their bodies with this practical knowledge and this embodied thinking, and in particular through their hands, uh, which not only writes or prays or writes prayers, but also need uh, the, and touch and work, uh, we can see, I mean, through these hands, uh, life tales, uh, the ends are tool to express, uh, full of cats, full of uh, calluses, um, due to the, to the, um, the labor with these uh, complex and challenging material as boiling sugar, as sticky honey, as the grinding almonds, are living and demanding materials. And uh, uh, they make us understand that uh, we are not speaking about a thought uh, symbolized in an action of needing, but uh, uh, as about embodied intelligence, uh, whose the baking nun uh, are gifted and aware of. So this idea that through the uh, work of their ends, uh, they create uh, and they give life uh, to new kind of relationship. But let's go to, to see some examples. And the first one, uh, I have three uh, examples of uh, this conventual pastry that for me are the most interesting uh, for the different characteristics they have. Uh, the first one is exactly this triumph of gluttony. Um, alongside the triumphs of sugar adorning the tables of the noble uh, Renaissance courts is one of the most complex and most baroque of the Sicilian uh, confectioners. And uh, is uh, actually composed of different uh, levels of textures and flavors that uh, are all, always uh, changing, depends on the nuns, depends on the tradition. But uh, normally it is formed by a sponge cake moist with liqueur at the bottom. Then there is a courgette, pistachio gems, two thin layers of short crust uh, pastry, white custard or blanc manger, then uh, ricotta in, uh, later on, covered with apricot jelly and royal almond paste, so like a bomb. Um, and all these different luscious uh, um, uh, dough can be differently combined, but uh, they make uh, a, a cake that has not a, a, a strict method. It's a dessert without a method because it's, it is made uh, only from the know-how of the nuns. And there are a lot of uh, description of it, uh, very nice and very metaphorical, like this one. This is another version of it. And uh, a writer, a Sicilian writer, uh, wrote about it like a green illock. It melts in the mouth like a cloud, spreading intense and amazing scents. It's like eating a mountain landscape uh, with all its woods, its rivers, its meadows. A landscape made soft and crumbly by a luminous mollycoddle cotton which contains and transforms it from joy of the eyes to joy of the tongue view. You hold your breath and rest with that extraordinary piece of sugary world that you have the honor of keeping suspended on your tongue view as the most precious gift of God. And in this idea, there is all, these, all the characteristics of sweetness that are interesting to understand uh, this uh, uh, relationship with the uh, communication. So sweetness uh, uh, becomes uh, a language of opening up uh, a desire. Uh, in this idea of this triumph of gluttony that exalts both palate, taste, and the sight, um, enable the, the nuns to, um, to communicate different things simultaneously. Um, in the expressiveness of uh, the sweet food, someone is uh, first of all taking care of someone else. So sweetness creates uh, the relationship through uh, this material thing that expands beyond the boundaries of one's own interior, interiority and individuality. And 
uh, it, it is something that we saw also in this period of lockdown, there's so many cakes that we make to take care of someone else. But uh, sweetness is ambivalent, this triumph of gluttony, because uh, it becomes at the same time an instrument of uh, sedation and of, uh, of manipulation of the emotions of the other. So together, complicity, intimacy, but also manipulation. And uh, in this idea, um, the nuns, uh, uh, through this sweetness, they try to, uh, to establish a, a complex relationship with the, with the, the giver. And um, so there is, from one side, this innocent quali quality of sweetness that become a, slowly also an instrument of manipulation and uh, um, precisely due to the relationship with solitude and with the impossibility of uh, verbalizing relationship this pastry becomes uh, in a way and the ears of the nuns uh, and in this way occasionally uh, the forms uh, and the, the, the flavors of this pastry spit out uh, sentences. Uh, some other listen, listen to gossip. Uh, they were um, they were the the materialization of uh, arguments uh, to lascivious, maybe to be verbalized. And in this way, I think that we can understand the confectionery also as uh, a pious uh, eroticism. So the names, the shapes, the flavors uh, reflect uh, a strong symbolism in this pastry uh, um, because they are capable of uh, communicating the incommunicable, um, like uh, missed marriages, uh, unwanted or desired confessions of distance, uh, hated or regretted family life, uh, resentment, devotion. And uh, this is another uh, nice example. Uh, um, from the leopard where Fabrizio prince of Salina uh, choose during the ball this uh, virgin virgin's cake uh, shaped like breast that is another very symbolic uh, conventual pastry and saying that uh, just looking at this breast like pastry made people longing for committing sin so much so that Fabrizio wonders why they have been they have never been banned by the Holy Office, and uh, I think the the form and the name of this uh, of this pastry speak for itself. I don't know to I don't have to to explain it so much. But this minne of the virgins is a, des a dessert of very ancient origins that can be found in different parts of the island, and uh, it's linked above all with, with the saint of Catania, Sant'Agata. Um, and Sant'Agata, uh, it's a story, the story of Sant'Agata, it's a story where the eroticism and sh shamelessness of uh, these sweet things are commingled with the mysticism of a martyr. Sant'Agata is notorious for being tortured and her breast removed with a pincer uh, for a refusal to marry the council, the consul of Catania, in order to remain devoted, and it seems that the cult of this saint and their breasts come from uh, an, the Egypt's Egyptian celebration of Isis. So um, the connection is also with a lot of rites of uh, fertility, and uh, uh, for me. Uh, the question is, uh, are these past three a way to show the unshowable? They could be interpreted as an innocent yet naive way to create a feeble but, uh, but uh, irreproachable, because sweetness is always uh, irreproachable in a way, because it's, uh, uh, it's, um, it's childish but uh, to create a bond with, uh, with the outside, uh, with someone else. So sweetness can be understand and interpreted as a form to glimpse sensuality and voluptuousness of the religious experience where the bond between sweetness mysticism and eroticism is is very it's uh, it's something uh, uh, very very clear um, eroticism in the christian tradition is associated with evil temptation and the devil whereas mysticism 
is an expression of the link as well as sexuality between life and death. So mysticism can be understood as a kind of transposed sexuality. And uh, mm, I think that the, mm, the, mm, the confectionery and the pastry are significant of this aspect, of the mixture of these aspects, because the preparation and the consumption of this sweet managed to bring together this tension, sublimating in a way eroticism in this moment of uh, celebration of festivities, sweeter sweetness and sweet food becomes uh, uh, together sinful and sensual and at the same time salvific uh, because it's morally unassailable, unassailable, untouchable. So there is a strong knot uh, between uh, uh, solitude, uh, um, mysticism uh, and holiness and uh, i believe that uh, the nuns in this way uh, live in this uh, unsoluble strain between a life of isolation in which neither speech nor erotic materiality can penetrate and yet together a consistent communication with through these pastries uh, where their holiness uh, is constantly intermingled with uh, these uh, kind of acts of eroticism. Strong, uh, strong uh, um, uh, um, asserts, but I don't know, this is something very interesting. And um, I go to, I mean, I'm almost done. And uh, um, these are different. Uh, um, types of this uh, minne di vergine are also called uh, in different ways, all still evocative, like uh, nuns teats or nuns whispers. They were, they are called nuns whisper actually in the north of France because they are crunchy outside and soft inside so that when beaten they emit a, a, a light and ludicrous breath. So, like a whisper from the inner world of the nun, uh, and which which becomes, uh, and this brings us to the last uh, part. Uh, also, in some parts of uh, of Europe, the nuns fart, le pied de non, and um, precisely this humor is another typical trait of the monastic confectionery production which uh, uh, for this reason reveals also to be profoundly Baroque. Humor is one of the main threats of uh, Baroque style. And one of the most bizarre and, uh, um, and um, uh, interesting examples are the Fete del Cancelliere from this uh, uh, convent in Palermo, Santa Maria del Cancelliere, that is famous for the sweet couscous, clearly of Arabic origins, uh, known uh, internationally, but uh, that uh, was also famous some time ago, nowadays not, not anymore, for this Fede of the, of the Chancellor. Um, Fede means in dialect of Palermo, batok or slices, and they are shells of royal paste. Royal paste is a mixture of sugar and almond or pistachio. Um, so-called for his legendary royal deliciousness. And uh, this, uh, roi this uh, royal paste uh, containing uh, white custard or ricotta and apricot jam. And they are made uh, inside this uh, shell-shaped uh, uh, pottery or ceramic malts. And the shell is uh, uh, very famous, uh, very used because it's uh, another symbol of fertility. And by closing the two parts of the shell, as you can see, um, a little bit of the compote comes out, making them similar to uh, male buttocks or female genitals. And uh, there is also a legend who said that the wives donated these pastries to their husband during the advent uh, when the church recommend uh, abstinence. So this idea that a shameless message in the form and taste of a sweet, uh, for, of a sweet simulacrum so that uh, by combining sweetness uh, uh, that is widely associated with naivety and childishness with the impudence of this pastry, one is somehow able to veil a message and to create uh, a ridiculous and humoristic uh, short circuit. 
and uh, that encompasses uh, a sort of celebration for those who have uh, enclosed, like the chancellor, uh, the nun within high walls. So the meaning of sweetness that is uh, sickly and satisfying at the same time, once again serves to understand, uh, to communicate feelings uh, through an ironic uh, male genital in honor of an ecclesi ecclesi ecclesiastical authority. And in this way, uh, becomes a sort of mockery from the nuns uh, or a claim for what has been taken away from them or rather an unexpressed desire that is shaped uh, in the form of a suite. But in any case, it's, a, it's an attempt at a diverse uh, communication that associates uh, one's own feeling with, one, wh with what the nuns uh, did and not with what the nuns uh, thought uh, may and um, this is the idea of a different kind of uh, communication and uh, i want to close uh, this uh, very dense uh, probably uh, lecture with this um, with this uh, idea of the gift from marcel moss uh, because uh, um, these past three were donated to uh, important characters of that time as i said but uh, uh, in the theory of uh, of most uh, the gift has a very strong symbolic value that is more the possibility of a bond and of a relationship uh, more than the the devotion of the gratuitness uh, of a gesture so uh, it, the gift is done to bind someone to me to a relationship and to communicate also one particular emotional state through a gesture and a sign so the gift is uh, gratuitous and on the economic side of the matter, but at the same time is morally obligatory because it creates a bond and a moral debt and is never inert, is always alive, is always the personification of a nun trying to say something, donating something sweet. <laughs> and I think this is all and uh, I thank you for listening to me for such a long time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> grazie, Thank grazie, you very grazie. much. Uh, it's very interesting. It's a cultural conference with many different references about literature, art, religion. Very, uh, very interesting landscape about your uh, theme. Very, very, very good greetings, uh, Madalena. And then uh, it's possible yeah, to yeah. time for questions and uh, about your, uh, her talk, please, for students uh, before and after, for uh, Gabriele, Paolo, yeah. and other uh, doctorates. No, it's kind of good. Prego, please. Paolo, C'è qualcuno che voleva parlare? Paolo? No. Please silent uh, the Israel microphone. Any questions for uh, Maddalena? Ok. Maddalena e Marco. <laughs> Madalena and Marco together. Thank you, Madalena. What do you think are the most difficult questions? <laughs> Very interesting, yes. <laughs> I don't know if we can uh, take a lesson, but as I said at the very beginning, we can maybe start uh, understanding uh, our way of communication and of uh, uh, being present in lives uh, of uh, the other people we care about in some different ways that uh, as not always uh, I mean it's it's not only always a, a matter of uh, faces to see or uh, bodies to touch but we can uh, try in, in this uh, strange times to, to use other tools uh, and to, I don't know, 
this would be something and uh, and also to understand that uh, um, the knowledge that we can uh, uh, we can um, learn it's not uh, um, it's not obligatory mental and does not pass through speeches or or uh, objectification but can be also an embodied knowledge we can learn and uh, know something through different means i don't know if it's an answer <laughs> thank you <laughs> Uh, come si fa a smettere di... Ah, ecco qua. Ok. Di? My connection is very low. I hope everyone could hear me. No, no, assolutely. Good listening, good uh, vision, no problem. We are 20. I think it was maybe a, 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 diff, a, a complicated topic. Maybe I spoke too, too, too much and too dense about this... Uh, very different things, but um, oh, Kali, okay. very good. You said that the nuns were banned from making pasta during the Holy Week because they prefer to make pasta rather than pray. Does this mean that if these women had other options in the outside world, they would have left the monastery? <laughs> um, yes, no, yes, I don't know. Uh, it depends. Uh, I don't think there is a a straight uh, answer to this. I think it, it was very depending on the on the will of a different person. Like uh, I mentioned, uh, as from Avila, uh, she was uh, she, um, for her monastery was a way for um, for uh, avoid an unwanted marriage. But uh, uh, I mean, uh, there were a lot of nuns that were obliged to stay in the monastery because they were the second or third daughter of a, a very important family too and not all and, and not only poor families uh, that they were obliged because uh, the first one was the one who that marriage or if you find uh, uh, an husband you can stay in the outside world if not uh, you are obliged to stay inside this is uh, i mean said very uh, basically but um, so uh, this idea of making pastry instead of praying, I don't know if it has to do with uh, a, pre a preferring of making pastry, but it was more because they were asked to make a lot of pastry because they were very asked from, uh, from the confessors, from the families, from uh, the outside world. So during the Holy Week, uh, when they have to pray more, actually they have no time because everyone is wanting uh, pastries. So, are different questions. Thank you for the question, Khalid. I don't know. Um, I think it's. <laughs> I don't know no, if there are other questions. Now is moment depend. Other questions, please? From Madalena. Gabriele, please, Gabriele. Wait a moment. Okay. So thank <laughs> you very much. <laughs> Madalena? Yes, okay. No, okay. I, I'm, I'm happy to see the face. Okay. <laughs> uh, so thank you very much for your talk. In my opinion, uh, is very uh, impressing for two reasons. First of, of all, because uh, there's an historical approach uh, that is not uh, only dedicated to um, a chronologic um, um, yes, a chronologic uh, view of history, but uh, is based uh, on a specific fieldwork. And secondly, because in my opinion, this kind of uh, research, this kind of uh, uh, also methodology is very important uh, in order to rethink the relationship between uh, body and food. But uh, I have two remarks for you, two questions, okay. no, remarks in a positive sense. Uh, okay. So I come from 
uh, colonial studies, post-colonial studies, uh, the colonial thought. And so there's a huge debate on the idea of archive. Uh, what is an archive? Uh, how archive uh, express uh, a form of power? And on the other hand, how express uh, uh, forms of resistance? Um, and my first question is on these. Uh, if uh, in cookbooks you have found um, uh, this kind of collective writing, if you have found corrections, errors, uh, or other uh, kind of writings, collective writings, uh, and how, what, what is your interpretation on this source? And this is the first question. And the second one is uh, um, about uh, the question you said, uh, uh, an embodied uh, uh, practice in cooking. I would like to ask you if uh, this kind of uh, embodiment is connected uh, uh, to memory, a shared memory inside uh, the collective group uh, of nuts. Thank you. Yes, for sure. I, I think uh, it's uh, part of, the, um, of this. Uh, thank you, Gabriele. I answered the, the second one because I think that memory and also this um, this uh, oral and uh, and embodied knowledge that is uh, uh, made through the passage from one nuns to her novice has to do a lot with uh, with uh, with an oral memory and, and embodied memory and uh, the use of their bodies and not through uh, speeches or uh, a, a written production and this is for sure a part of it uh, um, memory also in our bodily perception is uh, uh, something that we, we, I mean, we tend to forget, but it's something that uh, also in this moment where we are all uh, distant from ourselves, uh, we have this bodily memory of uh, what means uh, to, to, to have a connection, right? And uh, about the archives and the cookbooks is a very interesting and um, difficult uh, uh, question. Um, I, I saw only a couple of them. There is a, a big one, very famous, uh, from uh, founded from um, Giovanna Casagrande, I think it's uh, her name, about these cookbooks from a nun. And uh, uh, it's very difficult to decipher. I didn't decipher it. Uh, of course, uh, it's not m my job. But uh, I read what she she found, and uh, I mean, uh, there were a lot of uh, errors for sure, but also annotation drawings. Uh, uh, so uh, I think uh, it, it cannot be seen as a um, as a, a memory of something as. Um, I don't know, a transmittable uh, knowledge, but yeah. more as a, as a collective art, as I said. And in this way, uh, it's interesting to compare with the Juana Inés de la Cruz cookbook, who was uh, her attempt to uh, put in a rational way something that was not rational at all, because she tried to to uh, to translate into a universal form of a cook cook, cook cook with recipes and ingredients and so on and so on something that was uh, uh, something else that was uh, uh, a way of communication uh, inside the convent so i think uh, it's uh, for sure something uh, very interesting but also complicated to really understand as uh, as an archive in a way thank, thank you, you. So much <laughs> Other questions? i think eh? i think it's enough <laughs> no 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 a moment uh, please are you <laughs> Is a, a no. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, oh. I, I don't know. I, I have the feeling that everyone is sick of listening to me, but. <laughs> no, 
no, ma guarda un moment lì tu. And uh, ma do you think do you think about uh, uh, products without sugar, without sweets? Uh, is now is trend a new trend no the product uh, without <laughs> it's very interesting but it's probably the essence of sweet is uh, not possible to to taste now or not uh, it's uh, the ambivalent of sweetness now it, sweetness is the devil but uh, yeah uh, at the same time, uh, it is so bound with uh, our uh, moment of happiness uh, that is difficult to to erase it uh, from. I mean, but it depends, uh, by the way, because the sweetness doesn't mean uh, only sugar. It means uh, yeah, 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 absolutely, naturally. It, it means yeah. also a fruit. So we have always to to separate uh, the different levels of sweetness. But it's this is my thesis. If I I'm going to to write it, it's about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, then it's not no other questions. It's possible to finish. Okay. And thank you very much, Madalena. And uh, very uh, to greeting for your talk and also. Uh, greetings for your future uh, uh, thesis Thank of doctorate. You. That is, you probably for the 2021 is dedicated totally to to thesis job. Now, probably for you, and yes. then uh, it's seen that it's, to, it's possible to have a good product for. Uh, you are uh, only one thesis or more articles for your uh, one, only one. Uh, traditional traditional. Uh, Ok, traditional way. Va bene, eh, buon evening to all, buonasera a tutti. Grazie a tutti, thank you. And uh, I hope that the, 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 the next year is a more sweet for all, ok? Un anno yes. prossimo più dolce per tutti. Let's, tutti go all to, let's go all to Palermo to taste conventual pastry. Oh, good. Fantastic, very good. Ah, anche guarda, it's a flower for you. Eh? Sì, Elena. From Elena. Ok. Va bene, buona serata. Ciao. Grazie. Ciao, Thank grazie. you to Gabriele and Paolo. Thank you very much. Ciao, Paolo. Good evening, buona serata. Ciao. Ciao. Ma è possibile vedere anche tua sorella per vedere se somigliate? Non credo che... No, no, no. Ah, non, non vuole. <ride> È la sociological curiosity, sorry. <ride> ciao, grazie, ciao Gabriele, ciao, ciao Maddalena. Ciao. Ottimo, brava, grazie. grazie. Ciao, ciao a tutti.